Everybody, welcome back to the Beyond the Peloton podcast. We have a special episode today. We're dropping in something before the Vuelta a España. We recorded this a few weeks ago because I am on vacation. I'm I'm stowed away at a training camp, high altitude training camp for the BWR Lawrence. So we have Jonathan Kaplan and Andrew Vance here to talk about the Vuelta España. If we get any, if we're talking about any riders who are injured or not available, it's because we recorded this weeks before. So apologies in advance. But this episode is brought to you by the time of these two lovely gentlemen, Andrew and Jonathan. Do you want to talk about your respective shows? Andrew, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Choose the Hard Way is a podcast about how hard things build stronger humans. Have had numerous guests from the world of pro cycling the past couple of months. Come check us out. You can find Choose the Hard Way everywhere you listen at choosethehardway.com, at Hardway Pod on social media. Some recent guests, we've had Kristen Faulkner, Allison Jackson, Mitch Docker, Kerry Warner recently, and Derek Teal from Dialed Health is probably sometime around this episode drops colby pierce if you're listening i'm coming for you you're next <laughs> hey colby <laughs> the vultures are circling you better watch out jonathan do you want to talk about your newsletter writing with and then we'll talk about your you did a daily show during the tour de france that we'll kind of use to lead into the sure program. well thanks for having me so the writing with newsletter is on substack and it basically tells i aim to tell the stories of american writers and others from non-traditional cycling countries making their way on the world tour. And where can people find that? Ridingwithkaplan.substack.com. So you did a kind of an experiment. I was a lot of work during the Tour de France where you did, I think you did a podcast every day, right? And you never done a podcast before? I'd never done a podcast before and I did 20, 20 episodes in 21 days. There's one day I couldn't get it done. That's, but basically, That's basically, basically the idea was to, you know, for, for, <laughs> a novice fan base or enthusiastic, enthusiastic fans to sort of explain the, the origin of, of the Tour de France and some history of the, of the Tour de France and some basic plot points that I think that we've all discussed that Tour de France Unchained might have missed, like who wears the yellow jersey and what is it? So everything from that to you know how the race started to important races like the 1919 Tour de France, the 1989 Tour de France, and to talk to people who make up the race, mechanics, team owners, chefs, um, and, a, and a, a, you know, someone, a, a woman who, Henrietta Christie, who did the Women's Tour de France, um, Kevin Vermarca, who did the Tour de France and finished this year. So we try to run the gamut of, you know, to give people, to give people sort of the experience of the race itself. Well, it was a great listen, and this is why we invited you here today, because you've now, you've been embedded in the Tour de France. It finishes. In your mind, wow, that was the biggest race of the year. Probably the best race of the year, right? No, you're wrong. The Vuelta España is coming up. This is like the real fans like the Vuelta. The Tour is just for the casuals. Tell me just a little bit, like, had you heard of the Vuelta before? Or did you just get invited on this podcast, and you're like, the what? The what are we talking about? Like, how much of this have you watched throughout the year? Honestly, not that much because it's hard to find it on television. I do remember a couple of years ago, it was like it, it was on some obscure cable channel back when actually before everyone had streaming, like you could, I can't even remember the channel that it was on. We could watch it without, I don't think it even had announcers. It was just like the feed of the race itself. So, you know, I've seen bits and pieces, but I will say that after the tour and, you know, before I did an episode today with Henrietta Christie, who writes for human powered health, that you can listen to just about the women's tour de France and her experience. But without the tour de France, I was kind of lost. Like, I mean, I have a day job, but I was a bit depressed. It was kind of like a letdown. Yeah. Like, what am I no, going to do with myself? Yeah. We're here for you, man. We're here. Thanks. For you, I know. I know. I appreciate yeah. it. The, the FEMS is key. Unfortunately, they're moving it next year. We, we don't have to get into this today, but because the, the Olympics screw everything up basically. So they have to like, move yes, the FEMS. they can't have it the week after. I'm already worried about it, but I have good news for you. The Vuelta has been purchased by the Tour de France, by ASO. So it's on just the same way you watch the Tour is the same way you watch the Vuelta. The start list, we just had this odd, it's it's maybe a brand, it's a little new, but it has been bubbling for a while where the best riders in the world, the very best, let's say Tadej Pogacar, Jonas Vindigo, I actually spent the morning, I got up at 5.30 this morning to look up online how his name is pronounced. I'm listening to like Danish recordings of people saying the name. I'm switched over to Vindigo. 
they they go to the tour, but they're so good that you know. I mean, this is me projecting. I don't know if this is the facts, but like Remco Evenepoel, guys like that, Primoz Roglic, like yeah, you know, I can't really beat them, so I won't just I just won't go to the tour. So then you have all this runoff, and then everyone who's had a disappointing result throughout the year or the tour specifically, like let's say Enric Mas, Richard Carapaz crashed the first day of the tour. They've got to go to the Vuelta because they need to get a result. This is their last chance. So it's like a last chance saloon slash if you're a maybe not quite as good as the top two guys, you target this. So you, now what happens is now we have this log jam and then Jonas wins the tour and says, you know what, I think I'm going to go to the Vuelta and try to win that too. So we basically have every great Grand Tour rider here that's currently in the sport just minus Tadej Pogacar, who's probably not coming because he looked incredibly tired and beat up at the tour. But I think this is a, probably a better startless quality. And the route at this race tends to be a little wild. Time, team time trial to start the race for the second year in a row. You don't see that much in professional cycling anymore. And then it's not as much this year, but the vault is known for its hockey stick stages where it's just flat for like 20K or sorry, like 200K. And then you have a 15% climb that's 10K long. Like that's the vault. Uh, it's a little bit more nuanced this year, but Andrew, what do you, I know you're a big Remco super fan. I see the fat head behind you. Do you think yeah. he can, is he going to beat Jonas in this race? Is he going to beat Jonas? I think the big question is who's going to lead Jumbo Bisma because Primos of course is tied at three wins with Contador and Tony Rominger. He's in position to take the record to be tired. Well, to be tied with Roberto Haras for most Welta wins ever. Of course, Haras's 2005 win was the subject of a, uh, a court case after he was disqualified for EPO. But, I mean, you have to assume... Wait, did he Primos, keep that one? Or did, did he said, win five and then they kept... No, no, no. No, the fourth one was an, was an EPO, something okay. to do with EPO, but he did get it back in court. But okay. I, <laughs> I don't know. He usually don't get like a... Uh, there aren't a lot of false positives for Epo. Um, anyway, but the court, the court <laughs> gave it back. Could to happen us. to anybody. <laughs> yeah, Honest totally. Mistake. It was, yeah, it was it was whiskey. Anyway, he got that back. You have to assume that Roglic wants to take the record. So what's going to go on inside of that team? Roglic has had a great year. Wasn't at the Tour de France, of course. So I think that's the thing that's most on my mind. Will Remco win? I don't think so. What do you think? I know. I kind of agree with you. I think you're you're probably spot on. I I do I do wonder about this Ruglic, Vindigo clash. I mean, Primoz has been preparing for this. This is kind of, you, I guess you could say the Giro is the center point of his season, but the Vault is really his baby. Like as you say, he could tie Harass as the most wins ever. Also, sorry for Roberto Harass. He wins four Vueltas during Lance Armstrong's tour run, and like nobody notices it. Like I didn't notice yeah. until like yeah, I didn't either three years ago that he just won four Vueltas while I probably wasn't watching because I didn't have it on TV and then didn't know what the Vuelta was. But Harass, now we're giving you your flowers. Um, fantastic rides. But Primoz is really like, I think as the Vuelta has risen in popularity and status and stature, it's really risen with Primoz because he's, you would say, a truly great Grand Tour rider, like second or third or fourth best in the world currently. The fact that he targets this thing every year makes it a better race. They also are helped by the fact that he crashes at the tour every year and has to drop out and then has to target the Vuelta. But I think that if push comes to shove, you'd have to think that that Jonas kind of is deferential. That's that's a little like cannibal-esque if you're just like, well, I just won the tour and now I'm going to win the Vuelta. Sorry, Primos, but I guess it could happen. Isn't the trick for Primos to stay upright Right, he crashed out last yes. year at the Vuelta, so that's that's become the running joke between you guys. As long as he, whatever, whenever he ent enters a Grand Tour and doesn't crash, he wins. Yeah, it's something happened this year though. He got a new electrolyte drink. I don't know if anybody's read the Andre Agassi biography. Has anybody sure. read that? No, yeah. I've yeah. not read this. Okay, oh, well, yeah. He he talks over and over about the mysterious colored waters that his trainer gives him that he calls gill water. That he, he ascribes magical powers to these fluids, and I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on in tennis. I was like, okay, that's interesting. But maybe Primo's got some of that gill water at this year. It saw him through the Giro. <laughs> now we're like accusing. <laughs> All right, I'm not. No, I'm not accusing him of doping. No, whatever. He's just. He's got something. He's got something else. He stayed upright. 
Good job, Primos. I'm not casting any aspersions upon you. I also wanted to say at the outset, before we get into this, I mean, Spencer, your characterization of the race and its rise with Primos, absolutely spot on. In fact, I only know that Haras won four times because my son recently got the Guinness Book of World Records and came to me and told me that. And then I, I was like, wow, really? I didn't I don't remember that. The so domestique on Postal? What? Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was wild. But the... For anybody who's been around the sport for a while, the Vuelta used to be legendary, not for the racing and kind of that last chance saloon quality, which that certainly was part of it. But this was a race where the pros would go to this race and they would go out and get super drunk every night after the race and be in the discos till two or three in the morning. No, yeah, it was like known as a vacation. It's like a paid vacation to Spain and the yeah. stages start really late. So they finish right. late too. So you're up like that sounds absurd that Andrew's saying that, but you know, if you finish your dinner at like 10, 11, and then you go out, you just got to have a few adult beverages to relax from a hard day of riding the bike. You might not be yeah. home until three, four five in the morning. And actually remember Andy Schleck got kicked out of the Vuelta because he came home at sunrise and the yeah. team manager was not that excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this was back in the days before another team manager would dime you out for having a, a beer to a celebrate beer. winning a stage. Unbelievable. Right? Unbelievable yeah. what the sport has come to that people are getting dimed out for having the DOS boots in yeah. a nice all sauce hotel lobby. I can't believe it. But this Brutal. race also used to suck. It's funny. Yeah. You've reminded me of this where <laughs> I just remember it would be like, the only Vuelta content you would get is like Tom Boonen on a six lane highway in the middle of right. the country. And they're like, what is this? This is bizarre. They would just go along these highways. Like half the stages were sprint stages. Sprinters would rack up insane amounts of wins. And then I don't know what happened, but they really like they have pushed, I think, the evolution of pro cycling maybe more than any other race where they're like, well, instead of doing 300 kilometer stages, like I'm looking at the route right now. They only have one stage that's over 200 kilometers, and that's the second to last stage. For reference, I think the Giro had like eight over 200 kilometers, w way too long of stages. So they shortened the stages, more climbs, steep climbs. They were just going out and finding like the steepest climbs you could possibly imagine to the yeah. point that riders were like unable to ride it on their current gearing. I remember Contador was riding like a SRAM force rear to railer because it was the only one that had the it had like the beginner cage where you could put a 32 <laughs> two chain ring in so the vault has really kind of gone from just we're meandering along in like a hundred degree heat just like hot spanish weather i don't know they would just go out to the desert and ride around now they kind of hug the north they'll hug these mountain chains in spain and it's made it a much better race it's probably made it more pleasant because it's not burning all the time because they're finding places that aren't super hot um, but it is like, I'm, I'll just read you the start. This is like the first few stages. Team time trial, Barcelona. Next day, hills. Next day, mountains. Next day, flat. Next day, hills. Next day, mountains. Next day, flat. Next day, mountains. Next day, hills. Like there's no, the tour has a rhythm to it where they, they do less of this, but like three or four sprint stages in a row. You're in the Pyrenees. Then you have a couple transition stages. Then you're in the Alps. The vault is just you don't know what part of the country you're going to be in. <laughs> They're shooting all over the place. Like, oh, we have the Angrelu, which is like, 10k long at 20 percent. oh wow that's gonna be a big day and then sometimes they're in france like they go in for a stage up the tourmalade we're going back to the tourmalade guys on stage 13 so it's a completely it's like a beautiful chaos uh i find it to be amazing i don't think i think the days of going out are over because the racing has got a lot harder well the whole sport has gotten so much more professional i think you know you guys have pointed at that though uh, just make this point but i think you know having followed pro cycling for a long time and listening to you guys, you know, Grant Wall had written, had, has written about this, that, you know, the transition of soccer, like from the beautiful game to modern soccer has happened over the past 10, 15 years. I think the, that's happened to cycling. Now that was, you know, from, from the doping era to the team sky era, the, to the, sort of this modern era that we're in right now has been much more compressed. So yeah. Whatever that's yeah. Worth. And then what I'm looking for, you know, and Andrew and I've talked about this more at length about the visuals of the, of the, of the Vuelta, which are not to me as compelling as the tour or even the Giro, because it's so hot there and it's everything. It looks like California in the summer, everything's kind of brown and, and barren. But if they're, you know, if, 
if they move the race to more mountain stages where it's more along the coast, I think there's two stages in the Pyrenees, right? In 13 and 14 in France, racing downtown Barcelona. I was looking at the weather or trying to look at like the 10 day forecast, even though we're, we're more than 10 days out. But I mean, they're going to get a huge heat wave next week where tempers around the country will be in the 100 plus degree, which maybe is good to get out of the way. But that's a whole other topic we can have another podcast about is the effect of climate change on on the race itself. They are well, kind of there's... skirting. Oh, sorry. They're like the really hot areas like Asturias, Galicia, uh, Basque Country. Maybe they don't go to the Basque Country this year. And then the Pyrenees are a little bit cooler. I mean, Asturias and Galicia are wet, like they're wet and green. Barcelona is a little cooler, like 80s, because it's on the ocean. They have kind of, they've, they're not like just in Andalusia for 15 days like they used to be. Sorry, Andrew, what were you saying? I was going to say, I think there's this question also when you combine the extreme heat that we're now seeing in Europe during the summer months, which I think we can count on continuing probably for perpetuity, unfortunately. And you cross that with the direction the Volta parkour has, has taken. As you noted, Spencer, it's become more and more difficult and they seek out these absurd climbs that people can barely ride up. And in addition to that, I would say that more so than any other Grand Tour, the Vuelta has done the most to try to bring gravel into the race. So they have a lot of absurd finishes on goat path type things on the top of mountains that, you know, they're, uh, they're not places where you can get a lot of equipment, probably difficult to land your private helicopter, much less bring a bus up there. But there does become this question, as we've seen in Grand Tours in recent years, where once you passed a certain threshold of difficulty, which on paper seems like it's going to yield exciting, dynamic racing and really mix things up and give the opportunity for the lead to go back and forth or unexpected results, often what ends up happening is the peloton is so exhausted by the, you know, like day 10 of one of these races that they're just there's more or less a neutralization until the final climb anyway, because everyone's destroyed and no one can attack. So I'm curious to see how that plays out this year and whether we get that inadvertent neutralization from an overly difficult parkour. I think something the vote is, I don't know if they're doing this on purpose, but the zero, what you described is almost, I would say maybe killing the zero. It would be a, a hard term, but it's maybe how I feel about it. The vote that, Sometimes they'll just like they'll have other climbs, but sometimes they just have the final climb. So it's a hard route because the climbs are so hard, but they just won't have very many of them relative to the other Grand Tours. Or you won't have like three hard mountain stages in a row. Like there's only two mountain stage. There's only two sets of consecutive mountain stages on this route. They do. It does seem try to eat, make it easier, but then the intense parts are really intense, which makes for a better TV. I don't know if that's on purpose or that's just the way that the parkours are and that's how they're they're doing the route maps over them. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the first week here, it's all, it's kind of hilarious. Like if you look at stage three, stage three more or less is a climb the entire day. Stage four is, in, there are two sharp climbs towards the end, but in aggregate, it's basically a downhill stage. You look at stage, stage six is a climb more or less over 183K. Stage seven, is downhill more or less for, <laughs> for 200k it's uh it's kind of hilarious and then stage 10 that itt is is pancake flat that'll be really interesting because i feel like most of the contests we've seen with the most boring discipline in pro cycling that has the highest impact on races thus far this year we've seen you know sharp climbs and the most decisive itts and long descent so this is one where it's pancake flat and you know the gloves will be off the body and it will be, be good for you, Andrew. It's going to be short too, so it won't be as yeah. impact because it's twenty five k. So let's right. say they're going fifty six k an hour. That's like what thirty minutes or something. So yeah. it won't. You know, if you go back to the zero, it felt like we were time trialing for three hours of that race. So it won't be as impactful, <laughs> which should be nice. Um, and now I've completely lost my train of thought. Oh yes, the downhill stages. You look at those and you think this is kind of goofy. Why would they do this? Oddly, they've been in the past few years incredibly important to the GC. Like, do you remember there was that stage in the Guadalajara where Movistar blew it up in the crosswinds 
I think it was Roglic might have crashed. Someone was caught behind, and then Movistar was driving the pace, and they could have gained like 15 minutes. Valverde could have won the race. They ended up not doing it because everyone was complaining that it was unfair, but th that was featured in, the fir I think, the first season of the Movistar Netflix documentary. But there has, yeah. and then I think they had a stage a few years ago that was like the fastest recorded Grand Tour stage of all time because it was downhill. And then, if I'll, obviously, well, I'm now thinking about the Vuelta. Contador and Froome, I think it was like Contador, Froome, and Quintana did come here. Um, Contador towards the end of his peak, but Froome was at the peak of his powers and got ganged up on on the Formigal stage, and they attacked from the gun and beat him. So the Vuelta does have a, a spicy history of attacks on these downhill stages. Yeah. John, and then as a, as a Tour de France man yourself, what, like, what are you... <laughs> looking what are you expecting are you going to watch this race it's totally fine to say you're not going to absolutely now i will safe space i mean i need something i need something so you know you do the work and have the have the monitor on the other monitor on with the race in the background and you know this withdrawal from i hope anthony mccrossin's going to do the race on the oh, road feed I on peacock i have so, to imagine I, mean, I have to yeah. imagine he's doing it yeah he, nicholas roach mm -hmm. yeah i gotta get those those two guys maybe in the off season they can They'll talk to me and, and explain how, how they do it and what it takes to have that kind of endurance to sit there for, you know, four, six, eight hours a day with seemingly without breaks and to keep talking and narrate a race. And to One know so I, much about every rider. I know. I guess I guess that's all they're doing all day. So you would learn the kind of the if you ever watch, sometimes I'll get GCN for smaller races and it doesn't have commentary. It's just the race. Yeah. It's just yeah. silent. And you, you think this is how they have to commentate. It's it's a little bit mind blowing. Like, how do they know who is who? Like, you really have to memorize everyone's number, the way everyone rides. And then, I mean, we could we could spend an hour talking about why doesn't why don't riders just have fixed numbers that they are all the time? Wouldn't that make this a lot easier and uh, would be a jersey that you could sell? But right. Clever. This I, I don't understand why they don't do it. But can I ask you guys a question? Why don't teams yes. have to announce? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Why don't teams have to announce by a certain date who's going to attend? Like, let's say they could even say, you know, by two weeks out or three weeks out, you have to have your six guys determined, and then you have like three that you can substitute if necessary. Because I was looking at the start list, and Sepp Kuss is on the start list. I mean, that would be amazing if he if he did the Vuelta. It's, I think it's unlikely given. He's already I think, done he might, I think he might be. I don't know if they've announced it, but yeah, Jonathan, I think it's be, just because of injury and illness. It's pretty, that would be my guess. It's pretty tough to know who's actually going to be well enough to go to the race or they might be making last minute substitutions. I think it, but yeah. It, it, yeah. Like sometimes like, they don't know. He's coming off the volcano. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like they don't well, know. If he, does the, it, yeah. if he does, if he does the, the Vuelta, I mean, that's like, that's something I'd be interested in watching. Like, how can he perform after two Grand Tours, a very bl bloody, if not hard, crash of the last, what, second second to last day of the yeah. tour? People do it. I mean, it used to be more common that you would do three Grand Tours in a season. It seems a little crazy. I mean, that, that used to be the thing to go for the Grand Slam, which no one, I can't imagine anyone ever doing again, trying to win they all three Grand short. Tours in the world. Yeah. I think that if they shortened two of them, probably that, that would yeah. just be too hard to try to win. But I heard it uh, from an ex pro rider that current pros are telling him that they do the Vuelta or you do three grand tours in a year. So you don't have to train as much in the off season. Basically just makes your off season easier because huh. you're already stacking training for next year at the Vuelta. And you're doing it for free. Someone's paying you to be there. Free lodging, free food. Yeah. Can you imagine the money you're saving? <laughs> you're getting to see the country of Spain. Um, no, I'm sure these guys hate um, shuttling around in these buses and seeing the same places over and over again. But could be something there that if you do a grand tour at the end of the year, that actually does help your offseason quite a bit. I mean, how do we feel about this Yumbo team? Like, is this... I can read the start list for you guys. Rog Primus Roglic, Jonas Vindigo, Sepp Kuss, Wilco Kelderman, Dylan Van Barl, Attila Valter, Robert Hessink, Jan Trankic. Like, that's a really strong team. That's, that's not like as strong as their tour team because they don't have Wout Van Aert, but it's close. I mean, there's a lot of the strong guys from the tour there. The team time trial, I think, is they're definitely taking time in that, especially against Quick Step. Like, who's Quick Step going to have out here? 
Louis Vermarca at Remco Evenepoel and like a couple other random guys. Um, so I don't know if the Vuelta route lends itself to Yumbo controlling it as much as the Tour, but they're definitely going to be tough to beat. It's hard to, I mean, who and who's UAE going to have? Yeah, so that's like this is my next question. It's like I've shared my notes with you, Jonathan. So <laughs> I was hoping Tadej Pogacar would come because that would just be fun. Um, here's it's an interesting team. Jay Vine, Juan Ayuso, Joao Meda, Rui Oliveira, Mark Soler, Juan Sebastian Milano, who's a sprinter, I believe. Um, a good sprinter. So the odd they're going, they're like, head. They're, it seems like they're doing everything here. They have Jay Vine for GC, question mark. Juan Ayuso for GC, but he just had a crash. Didn't look great at San Sebastian. Joao Meda, GC. Soler, stage wins? Is Soler going to really be okay doing another grand tour as a domestique it seems like they've just got a lot going on here it's like uh, andrew your favorite ineos tactic of just throw a bunch of guys out there get four in the top 10 call it a day boom yeah, that's a great grand tour to do it i am curious i mean Juan i so sometimes I, I wonder if he's overhyped the man did get third at a grand tour as a 19 year old which is unbelievable and has never happened before not bad. last year at this race I do think he might struggle to match that this year. I, I, for some reason, I've become like the Joao Almeida super fan in the world, maybe more than his parents. <laughs> so in my mind, he yeah. could win this race. I, I maybe realistically, that's not the case. But I am, I am interested to see how if this beautiful mess of UAE actually does work out. And do you think Brandon McNulty will sh- will be part of that team? He's doing the World Championship, I think, in the time trial. He's been training in Phoenix in that god awful heat. It seems he'd be pretty well prepared. It, well, it would make sense. It's also funny because if you're listening to this podcast, you probably know the answer to it, and we don't know. Um, it would make sense that he would do it because I'm sure he's been training specifically for the Worlds. If you have a rider that is that good and that expensive, you probably want to race him in two Grand Tours. So I would guess that he's going to be there, assuming he's healthy. And is Sagan on the bench, or is he going to be showing up to ride wheelies? There's no <laughs> way, the group right? Right, I'm just no looking at, he... sorry, you know, to your point, Jonathan, I'm I'm cruising through the team rosters right now. I think you said this, Spencer, but I do see Sepp Kuss in here under Yumbo. So, um, and then there's Chicone for Little Trek, wondering how he's going to do. Total Energies has two writers listed. Astana has one. They may just show with one. I, I keep, I mean, I've told a number of people, I think that this is when Miguel Angel Lopez shakes off that UCI suspension and just shows up at the race for Astana. So I think that's something that could happen. I I think they just, so he just got suspended. Yeah, they like finally two days ago. <laughs> finally announced. I think out. they did it I think a team was trying to bring him to the Volta. Yeah. Because if think I'm of sure. it, if you're like let's say you're Arkea, right? What is your other option? Like maybe just sign Lopez and see if you can get a podium. I haven't read the details of that. What are your what's your take on it, Spencer? Is this just I mean, they never I mean, nailed him for anything other than something bad must have bad, happened. I bad mean, attitude. I, I got a bad got attitude. Caught. Get him out of here. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. That happened. Um, I think he was caught up in a criminal investigation into drug trafficking because his doctor was probably having him travel with performance enhancing drugs, which yeah. is super illegal. Um, is it just, you could argue yes, you could argue no, because if you're European, like, you remember this Operation Alderloss and this German yeah. doctor got in trouble yeah. and he had all these clients? Well, you're not, you're just staying in the Schengen zone with all those drugs. Lopez has to fly from South America to Europe. You could argue it's a little bit um, biased against him because he's South American, but it must have been for Astana to preemptively fire him. We just have to assume <laughs> it was not good. Yeah. I, I'm still, nonetheless, I don't like the language here. I understand why it's happening it's to protect the reputation of the sport it almost you know it's reminding me of minority report and uh pre-crime if anyone remembers pre-crime, that film. Yeah, exactly. yeah but it said the headlines here he's been suspended by the uci it's for, a provisional suspension it's which a provisional, actually it's i like, find a little weird that's what i'm saying provisionally yeah. suspended by the uci i mean but he was yeah, provisionally just suspended. happened to an Alpeson rider too. Due provisional to a, suspension due to a potential anti-doping rule violation. Could we have? Could we just have like a little more detail than that? I'm not really satisfied with that explanation for yanking a, a guy out of the sport. And yeah, sure they might have more information, but 
this isn't a matter of national security. I mean, like, come <laughs> we, on. Cannot, <laughs> yeah. we cannot release the details. It is yeah. interesting that, so another guy, Robert Standard on Alpeson just got provisionally suspended um, for, for reasons unknown, right? They don't tell you. It is, so there's all this debate, we are off topic by the way, but there's all this debate of like, I, as a journalist, I should be able to go in and yell in Wout's face, are you a doper? Answer yes yeah, or no, and he totally. has to answer. It's like, well, that never worked. Like, what, what do you want him to say? Of course, he's going to say no. If yeah. he's doping, he's not going to say yes. And then all of these cases are because of police work. Like it, re- like it's never like, oh, I was, I was in the mix zone at the tour, and everyone told me they were doping. And then I found proof and I published. It's like, no, it's like either real journalistic work behind the scenes or police investigations is what bust people. Yeah, digging through trash cans at Balco out there in the Bay Area. Shout out Victor Conti. Love your bass playing. <laughs> As I get older, do you guys feel bad for the Balco people? Like, who's the good people there? I don't know. I don't like, know, people man. went to prison. I think Marion Jones went to prison, right? Like, I don't know how I feel about that now. I don't. Barry Bonds is out there riding every day. I can tell you that he's a big cyclist. Yeah, because he was yeah. always seen as a jerk, and then now I wonder how much of that was like racially tinged, and then also how much of that was the fact that he was pumped full of Victor Conti's <laughs> injections. And because he seems to be like, I've just heard only nice things that he's just like a guy who loves to ride his bike, supports women cycling financially, or at least was for a while sponsoring a team. Seems like a good guy. What's going to ride, Barry? Come on the pod, Barry. We want to get you on. <laughs> yeah. And Andrew. Andrew, who do you think is going to win this race, if you had to answer? I'm going with Primos. Jonathan? Same. Wow. Me too. I thought that was. I thought I had a unique insight here. I but now like I'm going to root against myself just to, well, it, just because it taken such a strong position. You know, this, this is the way I found myself at the, with the Tour de France. I really wanted Jonas to win until Tade compl- you know, cratered on stage 17 and then I was like, oh, I kind of want him to win. Somehow, like in defeat, he was um, he was already. I mean, not that he was a sympathetic character, but he was just like more relatable. Wanted to root for him more. Um, but I think, and honestly, I just don't know. Like, and I mean, Primos has been around for a long time. I feel like even if you're a casual fan, you've probably heard of Primos Roglic. Remco is kind of new. Like, I just don't know. And then Andrew, like. Both of you guys have raised questions about his durability to race under pressure. Although at the Giro, he raced with COVID and won the time trial in like very in awful conditions, right? It was quite cold and miserable throughout throughout the whole race, but especially in the first nine stages. <laughs> After that stage. Yeah. Right. Couldn't handle right. the cold. Right. He faked COVID. It wasn't really I'm kidding, by the way. That's yeah. not how it really <laughs> And you know, is that I don't know. I mean, I don't I was gonna ask you, you know. Before you, I know you spoke about this last week on the podcast, but the what kind of race San Sebastian is and how much we should take take away from that race and what it means. That said, I thought it was like I, you know impressive. I mean, the way he his back, he, like his form is so good. He just looks so perfect on a bike. Remco, um, his, his back is so flat. I think he's, he's a pretty remarkable rider. But I'm, I'll still go with I'll still go with Roglic. I think the I'm thing just, with, with Remco that we haven't talked about is there has to be a high level of tension between management and Remco right now. And that's never good when you're going when you're going into competition. Many rumors of him transferring in the off season. I think the Enios matter that we talked about on the most recent podcast and his kind of moderate denial of those rumors. You know, there's high probabilities going somewhere else at the end of the year. Would winning the race be the thing he wants to have happen professionally and for his financial future? Absolutely. And anything that's happening like that is just a distraction to these writers at a time when they have to be totally focused. So I I wonder if we're going to see peak volcano Remco or, you know, is this front range Remco? Is he on top of the flat (laughs) irons or is he... At the top the of Antenna. Tenerife. Probably about the same elevation. But yeah. Remco, I, I, he is without debate. He is the best. At, I also love that Jonas gets so much doping 
crap. Like, this guy's got to be dope. And it's like, Remco Evenepoel disappears for like six months, helicopters <laughs> in, destroys everyone, disappears. And they're like, that's not suspicious at all. I'm not saying that's suspicious. But if you want to question Jonas, it seems like maybe we should expand the uh, scope there a little bit. But he is amazing at training specifically for a race, coming in and just destroying everybody. I actually felt like he was a little bit better at this last year, but that's why he had so much success at Liège. San Sebastian was one of the most impressive performances last year, San Sebastian, I've ever seen. The Vuelta, which I will admit was better than I thought. I think I said before that race, he wouldn't even win the Tour de Switzerland, which he still hasn't won, by the way. And then he went into Worlds, and when he's just able to prepare specifically for a race, and it's a one-off race, he's incredible. I, I do wonder about like maybe not his physical durability but we have seen him struggle at switzerland the only time i think he's raced in the alps in his career are those two additions to switzerland it's a little concerning to me he couldn't keep up on the climbs this year and then also his mental durability so you mentioned pogacar pogacar if he gets beat it's like almost it's not like he doesn't care but he's it's like he likes it he just loves the competition like that's awesome that guy just destroyed me rimko seems a little more fragile than that where it almost feels to me like they're protecting him. Like he can't he can't handle the mental blow of losing to Picacho and Vindigo, so we won't take him to the tour. I don't know if that is what happened, but it does kind of feel like they take him to races. They know he has a high probability of winning so that they can keep the confidence high, keep the machine rolling. And it's worked so far, but it is kind of all coming to a head at this well. He, he will presumably have to race Primos, a healthy Primos, a healthy Jonas, a healthy Enric Moss, I hope. You know, it's going to be tough. It's not going to be an easy, not saying last year's race was easy, but if we're being honest, that was not the, the most stacked field once Primos crashed out. If I had to compare a current Remco to a recording artist, I think he's he's analogous to 2018 Justin Bieber, who's taken some boxing <laughs> lessons and is like punch, punching people backstage <laughs> that he's mad at because they didn't bring the right cold cuts that weren't his rider. And then he's got the bodyguard behind him who can actually kick someone's ass. Like that's kind of the vibe I pick up from Remco. I, I know <laughs> Johan Bernil is listening to this episode and he's like punching the walls right now. Because <laughs> he thinks Remco, he's got this crazy idea that Remco Evenepoel is an amazing rider because he, I think what he's won two monuments, two editions of yeah, Liege, he's he's an amazing rider. I'm just hey, Justin Bieber is an incredible entertainer and has this been is true from this the is age true. of like 12 when he was put in front of the public and he was kept in a bubble and you know we saw Biebs really struggle. Eventually, he gave it up for <laughs> he gave it up for JC. He's moving in a different direction, you know. It's yeah. I mean, actually, when you put it like that, it is kind of he does he does feel a little bit like a bubble boy. I've heard he's a good guy, which I used to think not. This is not Bieber. I've heard Remco is a good guy. Um, I used to think he was a jerk, but I, so I don't want to drag on him too. No, much, no, no, no. He, I, but, I I agree. I also picked up like a weird robo vibe, and he was doing all kinds of things inside of races. I think this is the benefit of teams putting out content and giving a bit more access to people like us and YouTubers. I think it was Average Rob, the Belgian YouTuber, did a behind-the-scenes thing with Remco, which is where I learned he's into Gabber, which is a, a Belgian form of hardcore techno, which I thought was pretty hilarious. Uh, but, you know, he just seemed like a, a fun, friendly person. And it, it is not fair of us or anyone to, like, cast dispersions on these people as human beings. We don't know what they're actually like. We barely have any access to them. And I think that's part of what's amazing about Unchained. And I think teams finally realizing it's not just about having people with perfectly shaved legs on stage like Ken dolls. You have to show us who these people are as human beings because you get a higher value out of them from a marketing point of view. And what people actually want when they watch sports, like, yeah, you want competition, but you want access to the human drama and the emotion of what's going on, which is why I think Unchained was great teams putting out their own content. I mean, we saw this during the tour. There are a couple of teams that I think have been excellent at it throughout the year, in particular Quick Step. And like the UAE mini series they put out during the tour was excellent. And I hope these teams continue it. I have this feeling that the marketing apparatuses within most of these teams are not totally in line with the times. And we're probably not gonna see stuff until the spring classics. But if I were running a team, 
and I, EF is good at this, right? Like they'll continue to put out content, but that's what animates the race and really draws fans in and makes them interested. Yeah, results are definitely super important. That's why we're watching even minor races on GCN in the past week, which have been amazing. But like, you know, I want to know Kenny Ellison. I don't know what he's like. I just know that that guy's a fighter and he gives everything when he's out there racing. And I want to know what he's doing on a day off. You know, is he going to get Froyo? <laughs> now he, now I had, am interested. You've got yeah, me. Does he add mochi to it? Like what's going on? Well, speaking of someone you want to get to know a little bit better, Victor Campanarts at this race. Oh, this is I mean, the, this is the moment. Taylor made for these downhill the stages. Like he's going to have the classified <laughs> yeah. rear derailleur uh, internal hub thing and a 65 tooth chain ring. I'm going to tell you the stage he's going to do it on. I think we're going to see it on stage seven, which it's a bit lumpy at the beginning, long flat run out at the end. The sprinters will want to have it, but camp and air it's tailor made. And yeah, so what I love the predictions. I love the predictions. We just need a producer to go back and like take all of Andrew's predictions and then stack them up against, you know, three weeks, always, a month always from now. Right. Always right. Always right. So Jonas, we should Jonas. Like, we should just like pretty much Roglic will win this race and then like pause. Remco Evanapol will win this race. Uh, just <laughs> yeah. list every contender and then you can just pull that quote sorry go back to what we're we gonna say about magnus court because i was i was oh, yeah interested in the trade so his, his content does it go with oh. him like the ho i'm concerned about the hotel review i'm beating around the bush here will we get the hotel review from ef or is it going <laughs> to uno x with him i'm i'm terrified i guess it's ef's content right andrew yeah totally his Instagram feed is EF's content. I mean, is I that on his been. Instagram or is that on EF's what, Instagram feed? What are you no, talking like, about? So it's like a hotel review every day. It's actually who's quite on good. first. Oh, I don't know. He might be doing that on his own, but the, uh, I mean, likely with help from EF. I mean, EF is sports is sports entertainment and cycling is not pro wrestling nor should it be but the thing that the wwe does really well is it creates memorable characters and shows you some of their personality and whatever like what you're seeing through social media or team content is this the same thing that you're going to see at the scratch cafe over a, a glass of uh matcha lemonade probably not <laughs> over a but glass of scratch yeah, well, this matcha lemonade, I think, is one of their caffeinated oh. flavors. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I, I avoid the caffeinated stuff when I'm on the bike myself. But, yeah, like, get to know the riders, and I think that EF has done a good job. Like, think about the riders they have who are not people who have won traditional races, but that people are highly interested in, chiefly among them, Lachlan Morton. Like, very gifted rider, but, like, they just create amazing things for him to go do. People want to watch it. There's a, a social impact component to it that's fantastic. Magnus Court, one of the first mustaches in the Peloton, I think. Definitely has some great wins on his Palmares, but, you know, a bit of a character. Alex Howes, no longer on the team. He's carried forward kind of their content model. I don't know if you watched his Tour Divide content. I'm trying to get Alex on the show. Uh, Alex, if you're listening. Send me a send me a passenger pigeon. We'll get you on. But yeah, <laughs> that mean, might did, be how he has to communicate. I, I actually think it so might be in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. he lives but in the you, sticks. You get the drift. I'll stop. But um, I want more of that. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm I'm I mean, if I were EF, I'd be concerned because I think you're totally right. Their two biggest stars are not guys who I mean, Magnus races on the world tour. Lachlan does not. But without Lachlan Morton or Magnus Court, what is EF? Yeah, and I think they've done, you know, granted uh, all respect to Matt Bowden, they've done some questionable things like releasing the Xterra footage of Nielsen Palace. I think you'd want to bury that, but, you know, so be it. That was a great <laughs> joke. That was a you'll great joke. To, <laughs> you'll have to explain that. Yeah. The, actually, funny you mentioned about Lachlan Morton. I often forget how good he is. Like, I've been running, I ran into him like multiple times this week on the bike, and it's like, I'm like, I shouldn't even be riding a bike. This guy is, he's incredible. You would see him yeah. ride and you would think this is the best rider in the world. Like right, it's yeah. unbelievable how fluid he is. And then I guess he's just chosen a different path, but he was at one time, I mean, an incredible, incredible world tour rider. And he would probably show up now. Like if you're listening to this and you're like, we have a local pro 
He was pretty good. This he would smoke him. Like this guy could he could just have a living where he travels around the country. So remember pros versus Joes, and he's yeah. just dominating yeah. people's local pros. I, I would love to see that make that content happen. Yeah. I don't know. He hasn't he hasn't been toe to toe with Bobby Blue out at the Budweiser distributorship. <laughs> criteria, Spencer, the the way Olenta. that course is, it takes yeah. a it takes a local eye to to read that final corner. <laughs> <laughs> I remember being at the Sedalia Crit in Sedalia, Missouri, and someone was like, "If Radio Shack was here, how do you think they would do?" <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> dude, they would have lapped the field by seven times by this point. What are you talking about? And actually, I I've been I was did a lot of research during the tour because we were talking about people thinking they could beat world tour sprinters on climbs. And I had a, a local hitter reach out to me and say, I don't know, like how fast are these guys really? I was looking it up. <laughs> so the, <laughs> I was looking up like the coldest spend, which is the climb before they did the tourmalay. Alexander Kristoff, this is like a 30 minute climb was doing close to 1400 VAM, which if you just like look up your, your local big local climb, like I'll just look up the Flagstaff KOM. Full flag. Full flag. I bet that is about the VAM on that. And that's before they get to the Tourmalet, and that's in the Gruppetto. I don't think people realize quite how fast these sprinters are going up these climbs. So, yeah, the VAM on the full flag segment is – can this be right? It's got to be 1,800. No, this is not full flag, but this is just a part of flag, 1,335. So that's wow. not – it's not going to be 800 on full flag. So that, that, wow. if you – we're in the Gruppetto. You're going about the speed and the pace uphill. This is also at altitude. We should mention there's a slight altitude difference yeah. of like one of the hardest Shava segments in the country uphill. So these guys are fast would be my uh, would be my thesis there. Do not think that they're not. And I also think people underestimate how small they are. Like Jasper Philipson is that would be the size of a domestic climber. Like if he raced in the U.S., you think, wow, this guy's an incredible climber. He's only like 155 pounds. I think people don't quite understand how small some of these these riders are. Yeah, when I was road riding a lot, I used to do the Montrose ride very frequently in LA and the Rose Bowl. And Tony Cruz, who at the time, he had gone, I think, from Toyota United to the World Tour. He was riding for Postal. I remember this. Yeah, and when he would be in town, he was pretty much a domestique. He was a pretty diesel guy. But he would ride to the Montrose ride. He'd probably ride like 50 or 60 miles to get there. And then he would just pull for the entire two and a half hours of the ride while everyone was trying their very hardest to, you know, do something spectacular in a ride that takes place and stop and go traffic through Azusa. <laughs> and then and then he would ride home. And then he, he would also drop into the CBR crits that you see in the Williams Brothers content and Legion content and just freaking destroy the field. I mean, yeah, these guys are a, at a uh, a different level. They're a different type of human being. So I remember thinking I could beat Tony Cruz. I could not, by the way. <laughs> oh, <Spoiler>. yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah, but I mean, that's the thing about, you know, living in an area like Boulder or or um, L.A. When you get actual world tour pros out on your ride, or if you ever have the chance to ride with one in real life. Like Lance used to be in L.A. training all the time when I was living there. And, yeah, people would – whatever they'd run into him on a ride and he would just say stay behind me <laughs> and then you know because i mean understandably he didn't want anybody wrecking him while he's out training in malibu or whatever and uh, i heard many stories of lance someone who was like a cat one like very good local rider trying to stay on lance's wheel up like topanga canyon while lance was on his cell phone <laughs> his flip phone at the time just like making calls <laughs> I mean, yeah, when your FTP is, that's, I also think people don't quite understand that. Like if your FTP is functional threshold power, what you can hold for an hour, let's say it's 450, your sweet spot is like someone is a really, really good rider's threshold, you know? So you're just like tapping out zone three, you can do that all day. And then a really good rider is on their limit for, for 30 minutes. Wow. I think the most oh, popular sorry. thing I've seen done in, in journalism lately is the New York Times you know, the upshot column where they compared what the pros do to what average riders do going up certain climbs. This was done the, during the tour. Um, yeah. I mean, everyone emailed me about it. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I saw I, that. In a, yeah. Like, what do you, what did you think about it. that story? I mean, I thought it was cool. Um, we used to do a lot of place, a lot of those types of stories when I was running comms at Strava. So I was excited to see that in the New York times. I also thought, if you're the average person, like, how do you feel when you see that? 
I just thought it was ever actually when I say everyone emailed me about it, everyone who rides or is interested in riding emailed me about it, which is sort of a small network of people, though. Amy Walter, you know, well known political pundit, it retweeted it. I've never gotten so many likes on a tweet before. So, you know, like that when when you can yeah, it, it took like that level of person to sort of generate interest, I think, in it, if that makes sense. It doesn't. I totally lost my train of thought here. No, but I, I, I think what you're saying, Jonathan, it does give you that ability of if you have that like, oh, maybe I could do that. It's like, no, you'd be forty five minutes behind. Yeah. 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 I did the Slovenian time trial course, national time trial course in 2019 was pretty fit, wrote it pretty hard and it's, it's a climb it's uphill. And then Tade Pogacar did it twice as fast as me. You know, it is shocking <laughs> when you see it happen. It's like, Oh my God. Yeah. Like it blew my mind. So then when I saw the New York times piece, I'm like, yeah, let me guess. They're pretty fast guys. No, it's, yeah. it's unbelievable. The, the rate they're moving. I'm thinking back now on Milan San Remo when that attack went over the uh, Poggio. They were going like 28 miles an hour, right? Yeah. No, it they're was, like breaking going into the corners. Yeah, it's it was hard insane. to comprehend how fast they're going. Yeah. Anyway, wow, those pro athletes are fast. <laughs> <laughs> it is shocking. Like, if, I, I still think people underestimate even how good someone like Felipe Ogana is. When you see the right. watts he has to hold, you know, he's doing what, 650 watts for five minutes to get up to Poggio? Like, you know, in a really, good, a really hard race, maybe I would do like 440 for five minutes, you know, just to hang in the group. And then to think I'd have to do 200 more watts than that to be up there on the Poggio, it's, it's, really mind-blowing where do you guys going back to the Volta like where do you think this race will be won or where would you let dream board where would you like it to be won certainly not on the first stage I don't think I don't think we have to worry about that I think we're uh, gonna I, see do, I do think we're gonna see we're gonna see a crash in the team time trial I'm doing one of my famous crash predictions but that <laughs> that does I mean team time trials are highly technical they, I, I can't think of another race where these teams have had to do a team time trial this year. Can you think of one? I think the last one was, well, it was the Perry Nice. It was a kind of a funky team time trial where right. it took the time on the first rider. But then the, before that, I think it was the vault the last year. Yeah. And then it was I pretty think they, technical. I think they did one in the Giro last year as well, didn't they? I don't know. That's a good I, question. I, I would. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, I think that often, since this is not a discipline that people, that world tour athletes compete in very frequently, and it's way more, if, if you're watching this, it's way more technical than it looks. You're on a bike. You're not that, you're not riding all the time in a group, more or less trying to pace line and your bike is more or less a gigantic sail. And, and you know, and you're like, you're uh centimeters from the wheel in front of you. It, it is very easy for things to get tangled up. So I, yeah, whatever. Maybe we could see that happen. I'm going to say that this race is likely to be decided by day 10. Hmm. Yeah. That's what I'm Whoa. going with. Sad. Okay. What? Yeah. So yeah. On your crash point, 2019, there was a crash in the team time trial. Yumbo crashed. Right. Because someone had like a little kitty swimming pool along the course, just in their yard. Oh, They're okay. just on vacation. They don't even know the vault is happening. It starts to leak water all over the road. <laughs> Yumbo comes through. They all go down and Roglic ended up still winning the race. So you can crash in the opening team time trial and still win. But right. um, I, I would not be surprised if we, because as you say, they're going fast, like 40 miles an hour close to each other through bars, through the downtown Barcelona. We're seeing downtown Glasgow this weekend. Then we got downtown Barcelona. It, it could be tough. What about you, Jonathan? First, Andrew, great train spotting reference in last week's uh, uh, episode. I, I mean, look, I hope you would see like stages thir where the big differences are made, like 13, 14 in the individual time trial. That's what I want yeah, to see. I, I, I hope it's not one by stage 10. I think it will be late. I think these guys are so good, what we're seeing. Yeah, so you have the Tourmalet. I'm actually... I'm not even convinced these big climbs are going to see big differences. I think you're seeing I don't think so. that these guys are so, they're all so good and they're all so similar. It's hard actually to pry open time. Let's just assume, even if you think back to stage 17 of the zero, I mean, Jonas was unbelievable. 
know, I think he only took a minute on Felix Gall in that final climb, and Felix Gall was in the breakaway all day. Um, Felix Gall won that stage. But, you know, that's not a wild difference. Like, if you imagine Pogacar at full strength, uh, maybe he loses some time in the time trial. He probably only loses a couple seconds or at least rides even to Vindegaard, Vindigo on that stage. I think you're not going to see, like, these big mountains pry open time. It, it might be I don't think so. smaller, more innocuous stages that you wouldn't even look at and think well, that's going to be a big stage. I is there one that's saw- one? Is there one that's subject to crosswinds or you know there some could other? Be. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess we don't know yet because we don't know the winds. But oh, like especially these downhill stages, if that's crosswinds, cross tail. I mean, that can be really, really yeah. tough. Mm-hmm. I don't think we can dis- discount the fact that at the end of the season also, I mean, like think about Jonas and all these riders who are coming out of the tour. They're going to be exhausted. You're not going to, I don't think you're going to see them at the same level after a short break world championships for some of them. And then diving right back into the Vuelta. Yeah, that is tougher. I mean, Froome was never the same at the Vuelta as he was at the tour, which makes sense. I mean, I actually kind of can't believe Chris Froome, there's a former Tour de France winner who always is like, I cannot believe any of these guys go to this race. Like, that's the last thing I would want to do is yeah. just go to Spain and sit in the sun. At the the level of race has increased, I would say, since he's been racing. It's a much more uh, prestigious experience than it used to be, but it's still kind of crazy to me that Jonas is here. And one thing we do see, I wanted to mention about the Vuelta and the Giro is the margins tend to be a lot smaller. Something I've noticed in the last few years, the tour, the margins are bigger. My theory is because the racing is so hard at the tour every day that you just get accumulated fatigue, people blow up, the gaps are bigger. The Vuelta and the Giro are easier as just far as like kilojoules expended. So you don't see as big of a gaps blown open on the climbs. You know, like in 2020, Rem- Primo's won the Vuelta while riding the course slower than Richard Carapaz because he just racked up time bonuses and the margin was so small, those time bonuses could give him the win. So we, we might see something similar here. Is this from is... the last person to win the Tour and the Vuelta in the same year? That's a good question. It has to be. Uh, yeah, he has to be. He also must have been the last person to have won the Tour with oval chain rings, which we have never talked about. <laughs> I'm going to do some research. <laughs> I, I'm now really curious about this. That was such a big thing. Yeah. Where, where did that go? Gone. Why are people not riding oval chain rings anymore? I mean, I'm sure that they shift like dog shit, but I think that's maybe why. Yeah. If they provide, well, did you notice? provided a huge mechanical advantage, why would you not be riding them? Well, I, don't, I think maybe this, it's not totally clear on that. I, I mean, what I heard was they were they were obscuring power meter yeah. reading data. They were using yeah, it basically to muddle sure. the the data because yeah. you don't get a correct reading on it. Did you guys notice like no drop chains at the tour this year? You just had that broken chain from Niels Pollitt. But did you see any notable drop drop chains, Andrew? I think that well, there uh Cab had some Kevin, mechanical, yeah. right? Yeah, he, of course, he Cab did. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he dropped his chain, but he, he like had a, a, a skipping it of a skipped. gear. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. had a rear shifting racing incident. <laughs> because he got a new bike like 10K before that. Yeah. With different smarts. That's what yeah. you want. Yeah. Just like yeah. off <laughs> off the top of the car. Who knows if it's been looked over? Um, <laughs> no, it, you're right. You're, Jonathan, you have to be correct because Froome won the Vuelta, the tour in 2017. I can't even think of another rider since then who's won the tour. And done the Volta. Um, and then speaking of that, Garen Thomas, our your your best friend, Andrew. How how's he gonna do with this race? I know I said Primos, but if it's not Primos, it's gonna be Garen Thomas. I mean, that I do see I Love do it. actually I see a scenario where the favorites neutralize each other. <clears throat> Act of God, who knows? <laughs> who knows what happens? It and might the little take a engine, little spice yeah, of god yeah the the little engine that could just like keeps coming back just keeps going diesel drags i mean we've seen it so many times where the favorites are just punching each other they're pummeling each other at the front of the race attack 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 and the little engine that could garrett thomas is just keeps on chugging and, and finds his way back we could see it happen i think the way he wins the race is he never has a bad day and then the other favorite alternate other favorites alternate bad days. So it's like yeah. Remos has an off day. Kind of like we saw at the zero. And then like 
Joao has an off day, Remco has an off day, and he's just good all the time. And it's kind of, you get to the end of the race, and you're like, how the heck is Garrett Thomas winning this? That would be how it is. Another rider I'm curious is Carapaz. It's kind of go time for him. He needs to make this happen. And Enric Moss came into the season with a lot of a lot of chatter about how this was the year. Uh, disappointing year, you'd say, up to this point. So that's another rider and a home grand tour that needs to perform. But I, gentlemen, have to run. I apologize, but it was great having you here. Any parting thoughts before we take off and get into this hopefully fantastic grand tour? I appreciate you guys having me, and, and thanks for all your support. It's it's meant a lot. Well, thanks yeah, for thanks, coming on. Yeah, thanks for being here, Jonathan. It's fun to chop it up with you. I love your newsletter. And, uh, yeah, I think the main thing I would say is whatever you're doing out there today, safety first. Right on. Agreed. All right. Well, bye. And we will be – Andrew and I will be back on to uh, – we'll be chattering about this race on this feed. So just stay tuned, and uh, hopefully there's a lot to talk about. <laughs>